Well, tonight on Battleground, I'm delighted to be joined by Oliver Hartwich. Oliver Hartwich is a Wellington-based economist who runs the New Zealand Initiative, the country's sharpest think tank. He was born in Germany and worked in Britain and Australia before moving to New Zealand eight years ago. Like me, he's deeply troubled about the direction the country has taken under Jacinta Ardern. As he wrote in The Australian recently, in all, the picture that emerges is the country is in precipitous decline. That would be alarming enough. What makes it even more so is a perception that the core private and public institutions lack the understanding of the severity of the crisis or the ability to counteract it. New Zealand needs to be careful not to turn into a failed state. That does not mean it should expect civil unrest, but a period of prolonged and seemingly unstoppable decline across all areas of public life. Well, Oliver, they're strong words. Do you resile from any of them? No, I think I was still putting it diplomatically, but anyway, great to be with you, Nick. Yes, I've been here for a decade now and I've seen New Zealand change almost beyond recognition. The country I moved to in 2012 was actually a fantastic place to move to, especially from Australia. I came right out of the chaos of the Rudd and Gillard years. And when I arrived to New Zealand, I thought I had found a home because I was for the first time in many, many years. You mentioned I lived in Britain and Germany before that and Australia, of course. Um, I was living under adult government with John Key and Bill English, and it felt great. But what we've seen here over the last five years, the government of Jacinda Ardern has completely changed the country beyond recognition. And I think New Zealanders are now slowly waking up to the crisis that is thrusted upon them. We have a problem in fiscal policy where our government has spent way too much during COVID. We have a problem in monetary policy where our Reserve Bank has lost its way. We have a problem actually with race relations because this government is now trying to divide New Zealanders into Maori and non-Maori, something that wasn't really there when I arrived 10 years ago. So this country has problems on every single level. We can talk about the education system. We can talk about the housing market. We can talk about health. We can talk about three waters. There is not a single area of public policy in New Zealand these days that is not in crisis. Well, first, let's go to some of the structural issues because a democracy needs strong institutions and conventions to keep it in check. Uh, three year elections, elections every three years, of course, we've both got those and I think they're very helpful. But then in Australia, we have a constitution, we have an upper house, uh, we have a federal system where power is divided between state and Commonwealth governments. You, of course, have got none of those in New Zealand. Is that part of the problem? Is too much power concentrated on one government? Yeah, basically the way the New Zealand election system works, the electoral system works, is it's an elected dictatorship. So for three years, if you're in power, you are in power and there's very little stopping you. So there's no federalism in New Zealand. There's very limited local government. There is no constitution, at least not a written one. There is no constitutional court. There is MMP, at least. That's the electoral system, which New Zealand inherited from Germany almost 30 years ago. And that normally stops the excesses of power because it binds um, part, parties together into coalitions. It is very unusual, almost unheard of under MMP to get a one party government, but that's what New Zealand got in 2020. As a result of COVID, New Zealand had a, an election in 2020 in which New Zealanders voted for Jacinda Ardern's Labour Party and gave it an unprecedented absolute majority in parliament. That was not supposed to happen under MMP. And basically, it means that Jacinda can now govern without any checks or balances. We get three years of pure labor. And unfortunately, the country and the country's constitution isn't really made for that. Well, Jacinda Ardern put in place some of the toughest lockdown conditions anywhere in the world, certainly outside of China, thinking she could pursue a zero COVID policy. And in June 2020, she announced that she got there, that they'd eradicated covid from New Zealand, of course, now things are very different. I mean, the latest figures uh, in New Zealand, uh, there have been around 330,000 COVID deaths per million population. Uh, that's slightly fewer than Australia, uh, but uh, still in the same zone. When it comes to COVID deaths, the figures I've got, Oliver, 400 uh, Australian deaths per million stand at 482. Australia slightly lower at 476, Japan at 269. Now, to put that in context, of course, uh, the UK have many times more deaths as, as, as most European and American countries do. 
But, you know, she did not achieve what she said she would do, did she? Which was to keep the curve flattened until there was a vaccine that was capable of controlling transmission. None of that happened. Well, she kept COVID out of the country largely for a couple of years. Um, so we can give her that. Um, we had the first real COVID wave in New Zealand once the country was vaccinated. So if you compare the cumulative deaths in New Zealand to the cumulative deaths in the US or in Europe, you can see that, of course, we are still way behind uh, these figures that we would have seen in other places. So in that sense, it has worked. What hasn't worked is, of course, um, the delivery of the vaccine. For example, we were very slow to implement it, and that meant we were slow to reopen the country. We were slow to reopen the borders. I mean, the last bit of the border opening only happened last week. So basically, for two and a half years, New Zealand turned itself into a hermit kingdom with borders that were virtually close to non-New Zealanders and very hard to cross, even for New Zealanders. So we had cases here where people tried to get into the country to be with their loved ones, to be with their families at times of you know, deaths or marriages or whatever celebrations they had. They couldn't get in. We had the most interesting case, perhaps, with a New Zealand journalist, Charlotte Bellas, who was stuck overseas while pregnant. She wanted to give birth in New Zealand and couldn't get in. Unfortunately, she didn't have a visa for anywhere else. And so because she had previously reported from Afghanistan, she asked the Taliban, whether they would give her asylum. And the Taliban were kinder to Charles Bellas, Charlotte Bellas than even her own government in New Zealand. So it took a media storm until the New Zealand government allowed a pregnant New Zealand to, to get back into the country. So can you imagine that? So this is the government that liked to portray itself as kind and interested in their citizens' well-being. But in practice, it meant they were quite cruel to a number of New Zealand families, really locking them out of their own country. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the basic freedoms that were surrendered in New Zealand and elsewhere, but notably in New Zealand, were, were something I guess you and I would never have expected to see in a democratic country. Uh, do you think that those, uh, you know, have we now put those behind us or, or is there a danger that some of those measures that were introduced, some of those intrusive measures may be used in other circumstances or continue in some way? Well, for the largest part, fortunately, we have left them behind, but it has given us a precedent. The precedent is actually that it shows politicians what you can do if the population lets you get away with it. So that was the most shocking thing, really, to see the compliance of the New Zealand people, to see how far New Zealand people are willing to go along with the government imposing quite draconian measures. I mean, the lockdowns we had here in New Zealand, they were probably much harsher than lockdowns, say, in European countries, probably on par with what happened in Victoria, Australia. But yes, it was quite shocking to see how compliant such a population can be. And it's something I would have never expected to see in a country like New Zealand, which is still in the tradition, of course, of British institutions, of the British style of democracy, of the, of the rule of law, and suddenly you find yourself locked into your own home for six weeks and you're not legally allowed to venture more than two kilometers past your place of ordinary residence. So th this kind of compliance really shocked me. And also the degree of conformity in public opinion, because there was very little in terms of questioning whether the measures taken were the right ones. People basically went along and they were willing even to tolerate some probably unlawful behavior by the elected officials. Yeah, and part of that, I guess, is the media. The New Zealand media is uh, is pretty uniform, right? There's not a lot of diversity. And and from the from the conversations like this I've done with you in the past, and we put online, I'm willing to bet that the majority of people who actually watch this interview will be in New Zealand. So they're looking to sources outside New Zealand to tell them about their own country. This is an incredible situation, isn't it? It is. Um, so you're right. Whenever we do interviews in Australia, I can see these interviews coming back to New Zealand and then people say, well, actually, it would be nice if we could see this on New Zealand television or read interviews like that in our New Zealand newspapers. So, yes, the New Zealand media are quite weak. They have for a long time been compliant, actually, with um, all of these measures and they were not questioning them too much. I mean, that is a generalization. There are some good journalists still working in New Zealand, but you can basically count them on two, well, probably two hands. By and large, the New Zealand media is underfunded. Um, so, for example, we don't have any international correspondents left. I think by my count, maybe five or so. 
and uh, the newspapers are quite thin. We are reporting a lot on sports, on the weather, on human interest stories, but there is a lack of discussion and deep debate on the real issues that will determine the future of this country. So we've got a bit of a problem in our media, and therefore I'm not surprised that whenever we cover New Zealand at, in depth in overseas channels like yours, we will have a big audience in New Zealand because that's the kind of content that people cannot actually find in New Zealand itself. Let's uh, look at other policy areas. And, and the question I want to put to you, Oliver, is why has Ardern been so spectacularly unsuccessful at any of the reforms she promised? I mean, for instance, in housing, she promised 100,000 affordable homes. Uh, the exact figure, well, you can tell me, but it, it's, it's somewhat smaller than that, isn't it? I mean, it's just not been a government that's very good at doing the things that it says it's going to do. That is the biggest weakness of our government, it's delivery, or rather the lack of delivery. And you're asking, why is that the case? Well, my theory is that the government simply wasn't prepared for government. In 2017, for a long time, the Labour Party was at about 20% of the polls, until about six weeks before the election when the then party leader, Andrew Little, resigned and handed over to his deputy, Jacinda Ardern. So Jacinda Ardern came out of relative obscurity she was young, she was fresh, she was new, she was positive, she had a big smile, and that basically propelled her to 36-37% in the election. And then she was lucky because Winston Peters decided to go with her, so she found a coalition partner, the Greens supported that arrangement, and suddenly she had more than 50% of the seats in Parliament, and she was Prime Minister. But until about six, seven weeks before the election, it didn't look like that at all. It looked like it would yet be another resounding election defeat for the Labour Party. And that's why Labour simply wasn't prepared. Yes, of course, they talked about um, great ambitions. They wanted to eradicate child poverty. They wanted to build the 100,000 homes. They wanted to deliver all sorts of good things, but they had never really thought deep and hard about how to achieve that because the chances of them actually being on the treasury benches were so remote that they didn't even <laughs> really dare to prepare for that. And so what we saw in the first term of the Erdogan government from 2017 to 2020 was a flurry of, of working groups, of inquiries. So by my count, they had more than 200 such working groups where they were just trying to figure out, okay, we're in government now, so what the hell are they gonna do with that? And of course, they didn't get much done. So the first term was a wasted opportunity where a lot of talk happened and not much delivery. You mentioned the 100,000 homes target. That was very ambitious. It came out of a party conference, I think in 2014, 15, something like that. Actually, the stories I heard about that target, initially that was supposed to be 50,000 and at the party conference on a Saturday night, they thought, well, 100,000 sounds a lot better, let's make it 100,000. This is the kind of policy making that happened in opposition and you get away with that in opposition because you don't have to implement it. Once in government, it comes a bit harder and the actual figure on houses delivered from the 100,000 houses target is a bit more than 1,300 after five years. So you can see, this was a party simply not prepared, not ready for government. And then, of course, we had a few other crises to deal with. We had the Canterbury terror attacks. We had the Wide Island volcanic eruption. Then we had COVID. And so basically not much got done in the first term of the Erdogan government. Well, because she has achieved some things, largely the ideological crusade she, she set out uh, to, to, uh, to, 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 to accomplish you know, the woke policy, if you like, particularly in the field of, of uh, Maori, of Maori relations and uh, Maori empowerment. Can you begin to explain to me where the country is at on that? Yeah, I would be hesitant to explain that to you, at least not without um, a foreword, because I want to just clarify that I never regarded myself as racist. <laughs> and the other thing is, of course, since you mentioned I come from Germany, and of course you could never tell from my accent, um, I'm very hesitant to enter these race debates. <laughs> so from my experience, whenever you live in a foreign country, there are some debates that you rather leave to the locals because they are just too sensitive for you to engage in as a recently arrived foreigner. I mean, you've probably had the same experience when you moved to Australia, same here. So I try to stay out of that. But the problem is these days, there is practically no policy in New Zealand left where there isn't some race component attached to it. So reluctantly, I'm getting into that. I should also say, of course, I think of myself as a non-racist. I'm a classical liberal. I believe in equal rights for everybody. I don't care what you believe in. I don't care what the color of your skin is. Um, that's basically where I'm coming from. So with that forward, 
what is the government doing? Well, basically, we have a government now where about a quarter of the Labour caucus belongs to the Maori caucus. And they have some very specific ideas on how they would like to reform policymaking in this country. And it's basically along racial lines. So separate rights, special rights, um, privileges, if you like, for one group of the population, which comprises around about 15% of all New Zealanders, and then different rules um, and different uh, ideas and different policies for the remaining 85%. And so what we're getting, for example, is now a separate Maori health authority. So this country now has two health systems. It has one for Maori and one for one Maori. We have another um, development that we could see last week. So there is Environment Canterbury. That's the regional council of the Canterbury region, so the area around Christchurch. And since last week, we have two councillors that are not elected councillors, but councillors appointed by the Iwi, so by the Maori tribe of the area. And so it is basically giving Maori an extra vote on the council, well, two extra votes, while also, of course, allowing Maori still to vote. So if you're Maori, if you're living in Canterbury, you can vote for the general council. And on top of that, you can also appoint two extra councillors with full voting rights. So I would say, actually, from a democratic principles background, you would say this is not fair because typically we have one person, one vote. Well, except in the case of Canterbury. And this is the kind of policy now that Labour wants to roll out across the whole country. So we will see that now in Rotorua probably next. And um, basically it adds a racial component to every aspect of public policy, whether you like it or not. Another area, water. So New Zealand councils built up water infrastructure. So for sewage, for fresh water, for storm water. All of this was built, of course, after the Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840. So ratepayers have paid for this over generations. Now Labour comes along, effectively confiscates it from councils and then puts a governance structure in place where 50% of voting rights in governance of these entities will rest with tribes. Well, again, this is not quite my understanding of local democracy, and I think it is deeply unfair to ratepayers who've paid for this infrastructure, you know, billions of dollars over more than 160 years, or actually 180 years almost. So really, where New Zealand is heading with this is into a very, very dangerous um, set of circumstances that remind one more of apartheid regimes, where there are separate rights for separate groups of people, but it's moving us further away from the old British democratic ideal of one person, one vote. For, for somebody who doesn't live in New Zealand, uh, when I come to read official government documents these days, uh, it's like you know half it is in a in a different language, and and I'm just lost as to what they're talking about. I don't know whether there's a a Maori dictionary I should get, but this has been dramatic, right? In a very short space of time, the Maori language has suddenly infiltrated all sorts of documents, including Treasury, for instance. Could you explain some of that? Yes, that is a correct perception. So when I arrived here 10 years ago, I could easily read government documents because they were written in English and I had learned that at school. It's become a little bit more difficult um, and not just for recently arrived foreigners like me, but ordinary New Zealanders probably can't read these documents either because I think by, from what I hear, only 2% of New Zealanders actually speak Te Reo Maori, but we now have documents that are effectively half Te Reo and with all sorts of different words. Even the ministries are now renamed. So for example, the New Zealand Transport Agency is now called Waka Kotahi. We have a housing agency, Kainga Ora. So unless you're familiar with these terms, you wouldn't even know what these agencies are anymore. And the whole thing, of course, goes down to the name of the country. So in official government documents, you will not find that many references to New Zealand anymore. It will be called Aotearoa. So um, the change in language is almost complete now. It is kind of ironic. In 2015, then Prime Minister John Key had a referendum on flag change. That was quite a limited endeavor. So all he wanted to do was to change the flag and remove the Union Jack and have something a little, little bit more New Zealand, maybe with a coral or something like that. And even that was rejected by the New Zealand population. And it was a really kind of symbolic and relatively meaningless thing in comparison. Well, it's seven years on and they're changing everything about the country, including the name of the country, and nobody's ever asked about it. So how do ordinary Kiwis react to this? Are they up in arms? Are they all over talkback radio? 
Well, there are two responses you get from Kiwis. One is in private and the other one is in public. In private, they will tell you that they don't understand anymore what's happening. They don't recognize the country in which they've lived sometimes for decades anymore because it feels like a foreign place. The place has changed so much and people are unhappy with the direction of travel. The public response is different because in public, nobody wants to admit that they feel that way because they fear that they might be labeled racist for opposing any of these developments. And so it's a very unhealthy thing. I think if you polled New Zealanders asking them whether they still feel able to say what they really think in public, I suspect a large majority, maybe 80, 90 percent of people would say that they don't say dare to say anymore in public what they really think, which, again, is very unhealthy for democracy. China, of course, is ever present in our discussions these days, particularly with the tension around Taiwan. How do you think the New Zealand government has taken the threat of China? Um, perhaps we could listen first to Jacinta Ardern herself addressing the Lowy Institute in Sydney. While we all have a concern, and rightly so, about any moves towards militarisation of our region that must surely be matched by a concern for those who experience the violence of climate change. Well, there she is, putting climate change on a par with tensions with China. Elsewhere in the speech, she says things that are not black and white in geopolitics. We shouldn't force other countries to take sides. Uh, to us, that sounds like a, a country that's uh, in, the, in the throes of appeasing China. Am I right? Yes, um, you're right. I mean, with our prime minister, it depends what speech writer she had for the day, because you can hear very different things about China in the West from our prime minister. So she turned up, of course, at the NATO summit in Madrid um, about a month ago and delivered a very good speech, I thought, on standing together in the West and confronting the challenges of Russia and China. Just a few weeks later then, turning up in Australia, speaking the Lowy Institute, she had completely changed her tune and suddenly it sounded like she wanted to really make up with China. She gave another speech actually in Auckland just about a week ago at a China-New Zealand business forum and again, sounded completely different and basically made up with China. So. Um, it depends on what speechwriter she has for the day. She speaks to her different audiences. So she sounds very different when she speaks to NATO. She sounds different when she speaks at the White House. And she sounds different when she speaks to a foreign audience, mainly with the Chinese business people in Auckland. So there is no consistency in our approach. What I would say is actually that for a long time, there have been question marks over New Zealand's reliability as a partner in the greater concert of Western powers. Um, for example, we are part of the Five Eyes Alliance. We are part of a network of security and intelligence sharing with our partners in Australia and Canada and Britain and America. Well, actually, is it really Five Eyes left or is it Four and a Half Eyes or maybe Four Eyes? The other partners have some concerns about our reliability because we are no longer really automatically siding with our partners in that constellation. So they've actually asked New Zealand to do more, to do more than just a bit of intelligence sharing, but actually taking some initiative jointly on foreign policy issues and New Zealand has refused. So that is a change. It's actually a change just over the last couple of years because before that, of course, with the coalition and New Zealand first involved with Foreign Minister Winston Peters back then, there was a lot more pro-American um, out of the coming out of the New Zealand government. There was talk of a Pacific reset where um, our Foreign Minister Winston Peters wanted to actually work more closely with our Pacific partners. Um, because we want to actually counteract the threat of China in the region. That has changed now that Labour is in power on its own without Winston Peters. Oliver, thank you very much for keeping us up to date with New Zealand, indeed alerting us to some of the things over there, because as you point out, when it comes to uh, China and strategic influence, then uh, there's no more important, near, uh, no more closer partner in terms of geographic uh, proximity than New Zealand. It's important that we stay solid, of course, uh, in, in defiance of Chinese uh, uh, belligerence, but economically too. Thank you, Oliver. We hope to have you back on Battleground again soon. Anytime, Nick. Great to be with you.